good day, Facebook Live fans. We apologize for some technical difficulties there in getting started. Hopefully you're still tuned in. Thanks for joining us today. Educators Taylor and Nick coming to you from inside the New England Aquarium. We're hanging out in our penguin overhang right now. And we thought today would be a great day for a Facebook Live. <laughs> we originally planned to actually be outside, but the weather isn't really cooperating. So we decided to come back inside. And there are two primary reasons that we decided to connect with you today. The first, which you might pick up on in the background here, is that we are open for business. And this is Massachusetts School Vacation Week. If you aren't already planning to come, we hope to see you in the near future. The second reason has to do with something that's happening outside on our front plaza in front of our Simons Theater. Don Chappelle from Brilliant Ice Sculpture is helping us to celebrate the 40th anniversary of our North Atlantic right whale research program by creating an ice sculpture of a right whale mother and calf. You may remember seeing some of Don's work over the past 14 years. He's helped by creating ice sculptures that have allowed us to help celebrate New Year's Eve typically. So that's usually when you see his sculptures. And if you remember, his work is amazing. And so we're really looking forward to seeing that sculpture. The plan is to finish it tomorrow, but that's also a little weather dependent as well. Uh, and so we thought it would be a great idea to talk a little bit about right whales. Another reason why we think it's such a good idea is it turns out that this season has actually been a positive one in terms of right whale calves. There's already been 14 new calves observed this season. So let's talk a little bit about right whale calving. What do you think, Taylor? Sounds great. Okay. Alrighty. So per usual, we'll start with some basics. And in this case, some basics of right whale calving season. Um, so right whale calving season typically happens in the late fall and early winter months. And like some other marine mammals, right whales will move from one location to a different location in order to have those calves. So in this case, from up here off the coast of New England, and they'll move down into calving grounds in the southeast of the United States, typically Florida and Georgia. Female right whales uh, will be pregnant for one full year before having their babies. And typically, will have only one baby at a time. Um, so this time of year is when we start looking for those right whales, as Nick mentioned, and we fortunately have seen quite a few. Um, those calves will stay with their mom for the first year of their life. And during that year, they will actually double in body length. You might be wondering why females will move further south in order to have those babies. And it's because those newborn calves don't yet have the uh, kind of fatty layers of blubber that they need to stay warm up here in New England. So mom will move into those shallow coastal waters, which are much, much warmer. Now, after a few months, moms and babies will start migrating in the spring further north and mom will show that baby where the best spots to eat are. And those guys will actually probably frequent those same sites that they learn with their moms as they're young. And after about a full year of caring for her offspring, um, mom will kind of send the baby on its way. The babies hopefully will become independent after that first year and then we'll kind of navigate the ocean on their own after that. Now, this is some really basics. This is really high level of uh, calving season, but Nick's gonna talk a little bit more specifically about this calving season, the 2020, 2021 calving season. That's right, yeah. So as we mentioned early on, this has been uh, a season that's given us a lot of reason for hope in regards to North Atlantic right whales because of those 14 new calves observed. This is particularly important in the case of North Atlantic right whales because, as some of you may already know, they are critically endangered animals. And our scientists, as well as other scientists that study this particular species, believe that there are less than 400 individuals left in the wild. In addition to that, Taylor was talking a little bit about the, the sort of the calving and birthing strategy of these animals. On average, they, moms will typically give birth about every three years or so. But scientists and researchers are 
picking up data right now and observations that are showing that currently whales, whale moms are giving birth about every six to 10 years, which is a longer time period in between calves and therefore the population isn't being replenished as quickly as during healthy times. It's taking a lot longer to bring that population back up to a good number. Many scientists and conservationists believe that the reason for this has to do with some added stress on their bodies that's a result of threats such as entanglement in fishing gear. Um, and that's part of the reason why these whales are calving less often. Now, for the past 40 years, our North Atlantic right whale team has been studying, observing, and tracking these animals. And this has also led to the creation of the North Atlantic right whale catalog to aid in these efforts. Uh, thanks to our team of really talented researchers, uh, we know the backstory of a lot of these individual animals. So, although it takes quite a lot of good things to happen for a North Atlantic right whale calf to make it to adulthood, we still thought it would be kind of fun to highlight some of these individual stories. So Taylor, what do you say? Should we, we'll go back and forth. You can do one and then I'll do one. Sounds good. And I'm going to bring out my handy cheat sheet. Yeah, there's lots, I of, make lots sure. of details here to remember. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I want to get the information right. So we're going to start with whale 1145, also known as Grand Teton. And if you want to learn how our right whales get our name, head to our website, uh, check it out. We also have a really cool video on our Blue Planet Science series. You can learn about how some of these whales get their names. Um, so Grand Teton was first seen with a new calf on January 11th off Ponta Vedra Beach in Florida and she was spotted by the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission survey team. So they were intentionally going out looking for these calves and the really exciting thing is this is her eighth known calf but it has been 11 years since she last had a calf so this is pretty exciting stuff. Um, she was actually first seen in 1981, and at that time, she was spotted with another calf. So we do know that she is at least 44 years old, which is pretty impressive. So eight calves in 44 years of life. Pretty impressive indeed, yeah. Okay, so I've got one of those stories to highlight as well, and I've got a cheat sheet too, just like Taylor does, <laughs> to get the details right. Number 3860, who is known as Bocce, was first seen with a new calf on January 13th off of Amelia Island in Florida by the very same Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission survey team. Born in 2008, this is her second calf. Now, her first calf has somewhat of an unusual story. So back in 2016, we believe to have observed her giving birth to a calf, but this calf has never been observed since. Instead, Bocce ended up nursing the calf of another mother, and this calf is actually still alive today, number 4615. So, lots of really cool stories like that about all of our moms this season, yeah. And if I'm correct, and Michelle's gonna nod at me over the camera, there's a blog coming out soon about this calving season, so you can learn some more stories about some more of the whales that were spotted with calves this year. So stay tuned for that. Nick, before we turn over uh, to some questions from our viewers, I did wanna touch back on one thing that you had mentioned. So if you were paying attention a few minutes ago, you heard Nick explaining that moms are not having as many babies or having babies as often as they once did and i wanted to talk about that for just a minute longer here you might you, nick did kind of a great job of of kind of hinting at why that might be um, but essentially our scientists believe this is a direct result of human caused stressors and most specifically probably entanglement in fishing gear now one thing that you have to understand in order to understand why this is a problem is a little bit more about whale moms. So when they travel down into these warmer waters in order to have their babies, there's actually not a lot for mom to eat in these warmer, shallow waters. So not only is she traveling up to a thousand miles to these calving grounds, she's giving birth, nursing this baby, protecting this baby, and doing all of this while essentially fasting. So in order to have a calf, mom needs a huge amount of energy reserves. 
in order to get ready to have the baby. Now, entanglement and fishing gear also is a big draw on those energy reserves. So entanglement for right whale moms can usually mean one of two things. Either that entanglement in a fishing gear kind of draws on those built up reserves and therefore it takes mom a lot longer in order to build up enough energy in order to have calves, which means more years in between calves, which is what Nick had mentioned. And alternatively, this can also mean that mom, who is already somewhat depleted in energy from having and caring for these babies, if she gets entangled in fishing gear, this increases her chance of entanglement-related mortality, which means fewer right whale moms in the population. And unfortunately, we are seeing both of these things happening right now. So our scientists are recommending something called ropeless fishing technology in order to help combat some of this entanglement. And essentially what ropeless fishing technology does is it removes the rope or the line in the water that right whales tend to get entangled in. And we can touch a little bit more on that, I think, in a, in a few minutes. But first, what do you think? Should we open up the floor for some questions? Let's do it. Yeah, hopefully you guys out there have been listening carefully and have some questions for us about maybe something that we mentioned or just something else that you have as a question in regards to right whales. Yeah, I will point out we are standing in front of our juvenile right whale skeleton. So that is the skeleton of a right whale, but not yet fully grown, if you can believe that. Uh, so not quite babies like we've been talking about today and not quite the size of moms, but you can check that out for some perspective. And remember, if you have questions, just put that in the comments and our lovely assistant Michelle will be relaying those to us today. Do we have any questions, Michelle? How long do the whales live? That's a really great question. Do you want to take that one or do you want me to take that one, Nick? <laughs> you seem a little bit more confident than me. I have an idea uh, about how it is, but I'll let you take that one, yeah. Yeah, so this is actually one of the things that our scientists are trying to figure out right now. Um, they kind of do this in two ways. Observation of known whales. As Nick mentioned, we catalog these whales and we trap them for an extended amount of time. Um, and so kind of through that, we can get an estimate we also look at whale species that are close relatives of them and known individuals within those species to kind of gauge. So scientists think that right whales live to be into their 70s, um, but could potentially live to be up to 100 years old. That being said, we're noticing right whales right now living significantly shorter lives. So males more in the 65 year range, females as young as 45 years, and again, we think that has to do with some of those human stressors that are actually shortening their lifespan um, due to the stress on their bodies of those experiences. But we think ultimately about 70 years is the average lifespan of a North Atlantic right whale. Yeah, one of those things to keep in mind that Taylor mentioned is stress often causes the lifespan of animals to become repressed. It's certainly not the same all across the board but it's definitely one of those things that may cause animals not to live as long. That may lead into issues related to, do they get old enough to reproduce and replenish their population? That's something that happens with sharks. But now I'm sort of diverging into a different topic. So let's see if we have any other questions. Is there any way to affect breeding beyond changes to fishing? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, right now, our recommendation is that change to fishing gear, um, simply because we know that this is the primary issue that we're seeing with right whale mortality. So the good news is that because we know what is causing the majority of these problems for right whales, we know what the answer is to fix it. Um, and actually, our right whale scientists have been working with fishermen on uh, prototyping things like this ropeless fishing technology and also finding some solutions in the meantime. Um, Nick was reminding me of a spe specific type of rope called weak rope um, that actually has break points that make it easier for whales to break free if they do get entangled in fishing gear. So. We understand that it's not super simple to just say, all right, we're gonna change over all of the fishing technology in New England, um, but that is the goal, the ultimate goal in order to make a big difference for right whales. Another thing that we were seeing with right whales previously is ship strike, 
Nick, would you like to talk about what our scientists helped out with in order to eliminate some ship strike mortality in right whales previously? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I don't remember the exact dates of when this happened, Taylor, but you may remember more than, more than I do. I think it happened back in the 2000s. Um, there was a lot of data out there showing that the frequency of whales being struck by ships was pretty high, particularly in the Gulf of Maine area. And so our right whale team, as well as, well as other scientists and researchers, started advocating for a change in the pathway that large ships typically take to make it into harbors up and down New England, Boston Harbor, Portsmouth Harbor, some of the other harbors. Typically, these ship captains follow sort of a genetic, pa or, sorry, generic <laughs> pathway uh, because it's a safe pathway that's already been established. And so they all use that same, it's kind of like lanes on a highway. Instead of driving off road and finding your way to get somewhere, <laughs> you're following uh, the way, where the highway takes you. And that same thing is happening in the ocean. It's just not as obvious to us looking at it. And so thanks to a lot of hard work and advocacy, we were able to get uh, recommendations to federal policymakers to change the shipping lanes to thereby avoid where North Atlantic right whales are spending most of their time when they're in the Gulf of Maine area. And even that information is changing a little bit, uh, you know, all the time. We're learning more and more about where they like to spend their time at different times of year. But during that period of time, that has proven to be a really positive solution to dealing with that ship strike problem. I'll also mention, uh, on top of what Taylor was just saying, uh, supporting research is a great thing that you can do as well to help birthing rates, just help to pr uh, protect populations of animals like right whales. Uh, I believe our team helped to come up with the idea of weak rope. Um, and so supporting that research gives us the opportunity to innovate and come up with solutions that help all stakeholders because these things obviously affect fishermen and other people that are using these areas where the whales might spend their time. So we want to incorporate feedback from everybody. So support research too. Absolutely. I mean, we've been studying these whales um, for 40 years at this point. Um, and there's still a lot that we don't know about them and actually related to having babies, um, reproduction, mating, we actually don't know where that mating is happening. So we don't know specifically where mating is happening, which would be a really important habitat to protect. So again, by studying more and learning more about these whales, we can hopefully make better decisions and support policy that protects important places and also actions that will then lead to uh, an abundant right whale population. That's that's the goal. <laughs> Absolutely. Do we have another question out there, Michelle? Um, you kind of hit it already, but what can we do to help? And then another is, at what stage should we start thinking about the reproduce? At what age do right whales start to reproduce? <laughs> Nick, do you remember this one? Yeah, so I think we can use a little math from some of the stats that we featured here, Taylor. <laughs> okay. I'm going to look at my, my script really quick just to <laughs> confirm things. I think you were talking about a whale that if you, if you add things up, um, it turns out that uh, we, I think we, we know that Grand Teton was born in 1981, right? She was first seen with a calf in 81. Right. And so based off of that, we were able to estimate that she was 44 years old, right? So 81 to now would be 39 years, right? If my math is correct. Or about 40 years? 40 years. Yeah, plus so, four, so she was four. When so, she had she, so I'm going to guess that in the range <laughs> of four to five years old is when North Atlantic right whales are mature enough to have offspring. Now, please check my math, but I'm just <laughs> sort, of, uh, sort of using the facts that we already mentioned to kind of get an idea for that there. Yeah. Usually larger... Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think it's touched on in our blog. It's also in our, one of our blogs. Uh -huh. Michelle is telling us. Michelle is telling us. Yeah. Awesome. And I also think it was referenced in our one of our most recent Blue Planet Science series in a conversation between one of our right whale scientists and a southern right whale scientist. So you can learn a little bit more about all different types of right whales on that video as Make, well. I like this. They're making us work right now. This is good. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, Michelle? Okay. As always, you guys are welcome to continue adding questions to the comments section of our Facebook page and we'll do our best to answer those. And we'll consult our right whale team if necessary. <laughs> which, which may be true, may be the case, yep. <laughs> as, as we've proven. But um, we want to thank you guys for tuning in today. Uh, Taylor and I really have just scratched the surface here. 
when it comes to information about North Atlantic right whales. You can learn a lot more by visiting our website as well as our social media platforms like Taylor has been referencing. There's also some great videos up from January that are in our Blue Planet Science series that feature our North Atlantic right whale team. You get a chance to be introduced to all of those individuals as well as learn more about some of the different focus areas um, that they do their work in because they kind of all diversify a little bit. They're not all working on the same, uh, same thing and we have a pretty big team as they well. Do. Yeah. Uh, so it's really cool to learn about them. Um, and we encourage you to continue asking questions of and uh, finding more ways to help us protect this incredibly important animal. We've tried to give you a head start a little bit during our Facebook Live today. Um, but more specific to what Taylor mentioned, um, try to learn a little bit more about that ropeless fishing technology as a solution for dealing with right whale entanglements. Um, you can check that out on our website. And we also recommend always advocating for those solutions as well uh, by using your voice, by using your voting power as well. Um, you can always uh, ask Taylor and I as well <laughs> next time you see us here at the aquarium. And again, I'll just mention that indeed we are open. So please visit our website to remind yourself of our times ticketing policies. And that way you can also select your tickets and plan your visit. Um, we want to thank you guys for tuning in today. Hope you enjoyed it. Stay dry out there and we'll see you very soon. Bye friends.